Paul Brunton's Spiritual Journey, Part 3, My Second Initiation into the Overself, and Concluding Observations. One day I had no doubt that grace was at work because I could directly feel its inner movements as soon as I started to meditate. I was perfectly aware of a swift change from the ordinary to the deeper level, and of the inward pull which are signs of its action, and which repeated themselves many times in other meditations. In the result, the state of divided being, the state of disunion in the heart, which had been my general state, and which is necessarily the general state of all seekers, began to vanish. Instead of two opposing factions, the actual and the ideal, there began to appear only a single controlling force. This led to a great happiness, which makes unnecessary the search for happiness in outside things, circumstances, or persons, a searching which is one of the causes of this self-division. I felt that the desires and attachments I had cared about so greatly, anguished over and worried for, were not important at all in themselves, but only in the spiritual lesson to which they led in the end. All the little desires, all the personal yearnings, are really God-desire. At first it is unconscious, but with the growth of understanding, it becomes conscious. It is then that the will turns around to start on the quest, and that the desiring heart which has been looking and hungering for things outside itself starts to look within itself. By carrying out these exercises, and then consciously forming the habit of carrying their results into the everyday life and routine, I came in time to keep the peace all day long. This was certainly a great reward for all the years of toil and effort which preceded it. But it also brought certain responsibilities to myself and to others. Once identified with the cause of the true self, how could anyone ever betray it by expressing any of the uglier traits and baser qualities which belong to the lower self? Once it is discovered that all that is noblest in every human aspiration comes from this sacred source, how could one go along with one's ignoble tendencies? Negatively, one could not raise one's hand or open one's lips to injure a fellow being. One could not be antagonistic to him even in thought. Positively, one had to practice an active goodwill towards all living creatures. Because of the sweetness which pervaded my heart, the world looked different, and it was not difficult to restrain those ignoble tendencies. I was perfectly conscious of the fact that I was spirit, and that my neighbor, no matter how repulsive he might be, was spirit too. When I looked at anyone, I saw his outer person as a mere surface appearance. Within it, in his heart region, there was a calm center of divine peace. It remained unchanged, no matter how educated the surface was, and untarnished, no matter how evil that self acted. I no longer looked either for the worst in him or for the good in him, but accepted him just as he was. Each person I met was indeed a part of my own consciousness. I automatically and sympathetically identified myself with him or with anyone from whom I received a letter. I entered metaphorically into his shoes and shared his outlook, hopes, understanding, and even limitations. My enemy was explained, too, how and why he could not help being so. In this immense sympathetic sweep, I even ventured to justify him against me. There came a time when this attitude developed to an extreme and began to become intolerable. I did not know how to stop losing myself in the process of absorbing the other man into my own entity. The interior word, 
The voice of the overself, my soul, warned me that it was a preliminary condition and needed to be brought under control. I did not need to affect harmony with others on the plane of their ego. Help was given me for the cure of this condition, but I had to make a positive change of the will for many months to gradually become free of them. Although I did not get any cosmic revelation in those days, I did feel in a general way that behind the universe there was extreme beneficence, that whatever happened had its place in the infinite purpose. This applied to all evil events, if we could interpret them correctly. This strongly intuitive feeling made me happy and I wanted to share it with others and to get them to rise above their own experience into it. But, paradoxically, I did not feel any necessity to talk to anyone about these experiences, even to friends. This was because I soon found that to preach truth to the mass of people was of no use. They could not grasp it, and it was better to be silent about it, except to those few who were themselves on the verge of the quest. I was taught inwardly and confirmed by disappointment that people stand on different levels of moral character, intuitive comprehension, and purpose in life, and I was warned to cease to try to proselytize and to let the unready go their way while I went mine. The supreme lesson of all experience must first be learned by undergoing experience itself. There was no other way at that stage. What could I do for those who would not seek themselves, but only objects outside themselves? They sought to impose more and more fetters on their minds and hearts. The two directions were directly opposite one another. My time could be more usefully occupied with those who, having experienced the results of travel in the one, and satiated or disenchanted with these results, were at last ready for travel in the other direction. I prayed to become a clear channel for the unhindered flow of inspiration, goodness, and truth to such persons, to those who were seeking for these things. As regard the unreceptive majority, I found it was more practical just to let the feeling of beneficence reflect itself through me to them as sincere goodwill and outward kindness. In some way, and at some future time, the spirit from which these two emanated would touch their subconscious being and affect them, help them or uplift them when it succeeded in rising to the conscious mind. The result might be slight or great, but it was certain. During the years which elapsed, nothing dislodged me from those attitudes. If I would no longer try to push the truth upon others, neither would I let them push me out of it, and if they tried to, I could only silently smile at their foolish arguments. Experience itself was better than their arguments. I preferred to believe in the awareness which always remained with me than in the merely theoretical reasons for its non-existence. These two initiations were mystical ones and not philosophic. They enabled one to see the inner meaning of their own lives, but not of all life. They concerned the I and gave knowledge of the true self. They did not concern the universe and the human relation to it. Those subjects belonged to the field of a philosophic initiation, which came much later and was my fourth in line. That was an event which interpreted all other events. While still including the mystical initiation, there was blended into it the fuller perception of a cosmic knowledge. I discovered there were progressive degrees of the mystical initiation leading to progressive degrees of the cosmic one in turn. I have no experience beyond the first of the cosmic degrees, 
Yet even that slight unveiling taught me that the immense mystery which surrounds us will ever remain a mystery. The human entity is not competent to cope with more than a very limited degree of knowledge and still remain human. There is an iron ring around what it can know, a ring that we cannot pass beyond. What I went through in these initiations may fairly be described as finding the true self, that impersonal part of us, which is covered over and effectively hidden by the personal ego. But the second time, I found it in a very different way from the first, when the discovery had been tremendously emotional, excitedly rapturous, and ebulliently joyous. The second discovery was quiet, strong, and poised. This does not mean that it did not bring an intense, glowing satisfaction, but all feeling was perfectly controlled by the sense of dominant will, of the higher purpose fulfilling itself rigidly. Indeed, I learned later that one of the tests of the greater enlightenment is the extraordinary calm in which it happens, a calm like the one which follows the violent monsoon storm in the tropics. To write that this inner peace is perfect is no literary overstatement or emotional coloring, but an accurate factual description. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest is still as true today as when spoken by the Christ consciousness through Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago. Brother M. Thurston, Paul Brunton's friend and mentor, gave him the following advice. Quote, When you receive your illumination and pass your degree, you will then realize your work fully and occupy your place. Each of us has his own work and specializes in that. The initiate knows his limitations and works within them." Unquote. In the first initiation, I had only a vague notion of what was happening to me. This was partly because of its unfamiliarity, partly because I had little knowledge of the subject at the time, and partly because I lacked intellectual development at that early age. In the second one, there was not only more understanding of the experience, but better adjustment to it. Again, after the earlier experience, I found myself reverting to a child's simplicity, trust, and openness. But after the latter one, there was a desire to add whatever discrimination, wisdom, and practicality that my experience and study had since been able to garner. These two tendencies existed side by side and seemed to accommodate each other without difficulty. There was no conflict between reason and intuition or between reason and faith. Nor was this the only result of a paradoxical nature. There was another. When I lived in the Himalayas, I felt especially during full moon periods, like the solitary inhabitant of an unpeopled planet. It is not easy even today to forget those unbelievable mountains where silence is total and absolute, where nature seems to be meditating and man seems to be intruding. When I shut my door on the bustling world and retire first within my room and then within myself, it is as if I again enter into that still Himalayan world. There is utter silence within me. If I engage in work at the desk or go out into the bustling streets and mingle with people, it is as though a current is flowing steadily and incessantly through my heart the current of that same inner peaceful silence. Results from my second initiation. Now I come to a metaphysical result of the second initiation. In the earlier one, I seemed to expand the ego with love and delight. In the later one, 
I seem to attenuate it with perception and revaluation. Just before it happened, I felt that some drastic and highly important event was about to develop. When it did happen, the feeling was soon explained. There was a sloughing off of the old self, which was followed by a sense of immense relief. It was as if a tremendously heavy and burdensome topcoat had been thrown off my shoulders. The sense of being liberated was immeasurable. The ego's dominance was gone. I could see now how it had confined my thinking and dimmed my outlook. It was simultaneously a kind of death and also a kind of birth or rebirth. For in that life which was essence, I felt that the wishes, desires, attachments, and ambitions of the unreal self were futile, unnecessary, and vain. The entire existence to which they belonged was a dreamlike show, a passing cinema film. Those persons who were satisfied with such an existence were satisfied with a mere shadow of a shadow. They did not even suspect what the substance which cast the shadow really was, nor where it was, nor how to find it. This substance was the infinite life, the infinite consciousness. It alone was real and eternal. Everything else was only a shadow shape which merely reflected it. When later, in the Near East, an old adept of the Hebrew mystic Kabbalah told me that its major text teaches that the real man lives like a sun in heaven while only the shadow man lives on earth, I immediately caught his meaning. All the people I had ever known in the past or in the present, all the events of forgotten years as well as well-remembered ones, temporarily became nothing more than dreamlike figures in the mind, envisioned happenings in the consciousness during this second initiation. If one of my own thoughts could suddenly become me, the thinker, the transformation would be something like the one which happened when the ego becomes the overself. For I myself am nothing other than a thought in the over-self consciousness. Yet that discovery delighted me. I did not seem to care. My surface individuality was going or perhaps was gone, but somehow something mysteriously remained that was anonymous, nameless, universal, and absolute. That was the immeasurably important essence of me not the other with the petty desires and little idiosyncrasies which had wasted my time for years and distracted me from the true significance of my life. Here in this impersonal being, I really belonged, lived, and found happiness. After this, it was easy to see why people welcomed the condition of deep, dreamless sleep. This is not only for the obvious reasons of physical and mental recuperation, but also because it frees them from personal being, offers them an escape from the world and its care. This same freedom entered into knowledge of the Overself, but with a difference that the same happiness which is derived from deep sleep is here consciously enjoyed. Such happiness is really inseparable from awareness of the Overself. The reward of giving up the ego sense is the ability to live in the deepest part of one's deepest being, your soul, the Overself. Thus, it became clear from both these initiations that it was all important to rid my mind of the ego, or rather, of its crushing tyranny. This could not be the result of a single and sudden act, nor of years of disciplinary toil, but of a combination of the one leading to the other, of the long path leading to what is called the short path. Although it properly belongs to my experience of philosophic initiation, 
It is perhaps interesting to note at this point that in the deep meditations accompanying that initiation, I went through a stage where the ego's consciousness was annihilated so utterly, and where pure consciousness, not centered or divided in any way, was so overwhelming that God alone reigned as I am. There was then no duality of person and over-self, no hint of even the cosmic mysteries involved in the vanished world's existence. And that is really the truth. There is no second entity or power. There is only God. Excerpts from the two essays in the Notebooks of Paul Brunton, Volume 8, that form these three videos, were perhaps composed when the author was in his mid to late 50s, and PB's journey continued for more than another 25 years. Paul Brunton, 1898 to 1981, a best-selling British author of a dozen books, spent much of his early life researching the original sacred teachings of Western and Eastern spiritual traditions. He traveled the world to discover and communicate with Christian, Kabbalistic, Vedantic, Buddhist, Taoist, indigenous, and Sufi masters. Blending the richness of his own spiritual experience and inquiry with these ancient and contemporary teachings, he developed a philosophy and path of practice that suits life in the 21st century, one that expresses the greatest wisdom and love available to humankind. Regardless of how it is named, we each have a divine soul an over-self or higher self that is with us here and now waiting to be realized. Paul Brunton's writings are a source of deep spiritual guidance for all those interested in living a divinely inspired life.